with me effect or with meaning. The party who endows the ritual with meaning is the one who performs it with the proper intention. Now, as one would expect, this is not the only opinion one finds in the Mishnah either. Rabbi Eliezer ben Horkinus disagrees with this general, essentially prevalent view, and he argues that the word chatat does not refer to the sacrifice, but to the act of sprinkling kitui, and that the para aduma is not a real sacrifice, and so he does not demand the same kind of intentionality for the para aduma as does the Tanakama, the anonymous authority in the Mishnah. But even Rabbi Eliezer is still operating within the same matrix of meaning, just not as intensively. And let me just read with you one Mishnah which exemplifies the argument between the Tanakama and Rabbi Eliezer and the overall context in which their disagreement takes place. That's the last section here. I'm not going to read all of it. Let me just uh, read the very beginning and the very end. Um, Parat Khatat, that's the phrase here, for a paraduma, red heifer, shishichatat shalolishma, if it was slaughtered, not for the intention of slaughtering a paraduma, or kibail, or the blood was received, not for the intention of a paraduma, or the hiza, where it was sprinkled, shalolishma, not for the intention, okay, or one, he sprinkled lishma, and then uh, I'm sorry, he received the blood lishma, the, and the, or he sprinkled bishalol lishma, not for the sake of the paraduma, or the other way around, he received the blood shalol lishma, not for the paraduma, and then he sprinkled lishma for the sake of the paraduma. In either one of these, any one of these cases, psula, it's no longer a good red heifer. But Rebbe Eliezer Machshir, he does say it's okay. Why? He, does, he, he doesn't consider it a, a sacrifice, and therefore he doesn't require the same kind of intensive intentionality. But as you can see, his opinion wouldn't make sense unless there was someone requiring that kind of intentionality. Okay. And if the priest who performed the act did not wash his hands and his feet the way he had to, I mean, ritually, it is also invalid. But Rabbi Eliezer Machshir, again, for the same reason, he says it's okay because it's not actually a sacrifice. And also, if, you, uh, if it was performed by a priest other than the high priest, it's also pasul, which is a requirement, according to the anonymous uh, authority of the Mishnah, is a requirement of the sac this type of sacrifice. It's invalid. But Rabbi Yehuda Machshir, he says it is okay. And the Mechusar Begadim Pesula, and if he wasn't wearing the four types of priestly clothes, it's also Pesul, Ubechle Laban Haitan and it actually had to be slaughtered and sprinkled and so on and burnt with the priest wearing the white clothes. These are the same white clothes that the priest had to wear when he performed the Yom Kippur ritual. Okay, and there is a kind of analogy between these two. But there you see the type of disagreement between the two of them and how there, the, at least the Tanakama, the anonymous authority of the Mishnah, is requiring this kind of uh, constant intentionality within every act of the performance of the Para Aduma. At the very end of the next paragraph, um, you'll see uh, the final statement of Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Ein makshava poselet ba parai says no intention doesn't matter. Okay, why? Because it's not a sacrifice. But again, this statement I think is 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 it's only makes sense within the matrix of the person he's arguing against, which says that no, it does matter. Now, um, the mission's approach to the paraduma then is that the meaning of this ritual lies in the meaning with which the one who performs it endows it. It's because the person performing it has the intention of it serving the purpose, okay, that the act has meaning. It's as though the ritual itself is almost a kind of empty vessel into which one pours meaning, or that miraculously its meaning is one that must be intentionally given it at every point. Now this is an approach that I think my father also would have definitely espoused. There always remains something very European and un-American about my father, and the way he quite consciously and explicitly examined his life and sought to find a greater meaning in it, almost a kind of philosophical meaning, and especially so in its details. In March, I went to Israel to see him after he broke his hip in a freak accident. This was the first time in his life that he had not lived independently, 
we had to hire a Filipino to help care for him. And being dependent on another person was very difficult for him. He really missed his independence and freedom. On the last Friday that I was there, I had to take him back to the hospital to have another test. And somewhat inexplicably, in the hospital, he surprisingly cheered up and gave me through the course of that day on Friday and on the next, on Shabbat afternoon, a good three-hour lecture, it was at least three hours, about his <laughs> life and its meaning. It was a remarkable tour de force. I don't think I could do that for my own life. And in the eulogy I delivered at his funeral, I basically summed up what he had told me about himself. Uh, in short, he wrote his own eulogy. Mm -hmm. What was most remarkable about the whole thing, however, was how reconciled he was to his life. And I say that word, reconciled, not resigned, not bitter, not you know, somewhat satisfied, but truly reconciled. He knew exactly what he had accomplished, what he had not, but without bitterness and regrets, and only, and this is really the key thing, with enormous gratitude to God. Mm -hmm. That famous phrase from Avot 4.1, Eza huwa shir hasamech b'chalko, who is the happy man, the one who is happy with his lot, finally made sense to me. Para, like many other Mishnaic treatises, actually follows a narrative and its structure. In this case, it clearly follows the narrative of the ritual itself. Its first chapters are about choosing the right cow, then it goes on to the preparation of the waters, and then through the entire rest of the ritual, ending with the sprinkling itself. The last mission is based on a close exegesis of two verses in the chapter in Bamidbar. In verse 19, 19 there, we're told that a clean person shall sprinkle upon the unclean person on the third day, the Yom HaShlishi, and on the seventh day, Yom HaShvi'i. In the preceding verse, in turn, we're told that a pure person takes the hyssop and then dips it in the mei the lustration waters, and then sprinkles it, the taval v'hizahu. And thus, according to the Mishnah, the Torah equates the separate acts of dipping and sprinkling as both having to be done during the day. And this is the background you need for understanding the final Mishnah. Taval, and this is the very bottom of uh, page three, if he dipped the hyssop branch with which he then sprinkles the person, dips it into the waters of lustration, uh, he did it in the day and then he sprinkles in the day, then it's kasher. That's the optimum case. That's what you want. But if he dipped it during the day and then waited till the evening to sprinkle, or Balaila, the Hizab Bayom, or if he dipped it in nut, at night, the preceding night, and then sprinkled the next morning, it's Pasul. He has to dip and he has to sprinkle both during the day. But the person himself can go to the mikvah and ritually immerse himself, which he also is required to do, the preceding night. Unlike the Hyssop, he can immerse himself the preceding night. And he can be sprinkled during the following day. Because you don't sprinkle until the sun first glimmers, until the beginning of the day. Okay? But the Mishnah adds if someone actually was so eager to be sprinkled, and did it when the morning star first appeared, which is about an hour before the sun actually first begins to rise, it's still retroactively, or in fact, okay, kasher. Um, so the Amun shachar, the morning star, is the official end of night. And once the long last night of impurity has ended, it is never too early to be sprinkled and made pure so as to be able to serve God. Uh, we conclude with the statement of Rabbi Hanani ben Akasha Omer, Ratzah Kadosh Baruch Hu Zakhod at Yisrael, Lefichav Hirba Lehem Torah Mitzvot Shneamar, Hashem Chafetz Laman Tito Yagil Torah Yadir. Rabbi Hanani ben Akasha said, uh, "Everybody, uh, the uh, the blessed, the Holy One, blessed be He, wished to give Israel merit, and therefore He made great for them Torah and commandments, as it is said." God desired for the sake of Israel's righteousness that the Torah be made great and glorious. And we say, Kaddish to Rabbanan. Sure. In honor of your father and in honor of you, um, you mentioned to me yesterday that you had done the research on Rokeh.
And then you handed out this text, and I we were going to explain why you handed out this particular text and what connection this text had to your father. And when I turned to, and said, well, I know the reason he handed out this text, which was none of the reasons that you gave. <laughs> um, but in fact, to me, is, is greatly um, in honor of your father. And it has to do with the, really the tension in Judaism between God as a healer and, and ourselves as healers. And especially that this, this tension starts in the Torah. Um, it's not clear how it's going to, whether we're going to become, you know, Christian scientists or whether we're actually, you know, going to view as the tradition ultimately came to view it, that this kind of knowledge God hands down to us to deal with. It's not that God is the one doing the healing as it is sometimes, uh, you know, appears in the Torah. And I looked at this text and I said, you're talking about absorbing Tuma. But what your father, in fact, I mean, Rachel can, can probably knows more about Rogan than I, a geriatrician. Um, <laughs> what Rogan is about is absorbing impurities. Right. What Rogan right. is really about is the scientific equivalent mm. of what this right. whole process is about. Right. And in a sense, the, the preciseness of the process. That's what I thought, but I actually didn't know enough science to say it. Mm. The, the preciseness it's like of the immunization, whole process yeah. that you talk about, you know, in terms of in terms of what of what this you know about how you have to go about getting rid of tumor, the precise precision, the sense that your your father had that this knowledge which God has passed down to him to use to try to bring healing to people and um, you know also has this same element of preciseness. If you don't do the science right, you're really not going to be a very good physician or a good healer, and you're not going to be in the image of God in that sense. That that sense that I have, at least, that the responsibility of physicians, in certain ways, picking up um, without the hubris, uh, you know, that some physicians have about it all, the sense of the priestly tradition. We don't have that priestly tradition. It's been it's been handed over to us to try to figure out ways to heal and mm -hmm. ways to represent holiness in ways that can have you know direct effects um, that we can learn. And my sense about your you know everything about your father was there was a reason why you picked this text today. Mm -hmm. right. Your father said nothing happens by chance. You just said, and I don't think this happened by chance either, because I think that right. somehow it represents. In, you know, it represents in, in contemporary terms um, what we interpret in very different ways in... in um, no, thank you. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, Kadisha Rabbanan is on page 13. <laughs>